Let's start our discussion of part two of Franz Kafka's The Trial with a little Kafka joke. So a defense attorney says to his client, I got some good news and some bad news for you. And the client, feeling pretty optimistic, says, well, give me the bad news first. Defense attorney says, well, they've given you the death penalty. <laughs> and the client's <laughs> apoplectic. He's like, what's the good news? And the attorney says, I got the voltage lowered. So to me, this is the perfect joke about Joseph K. in the trial. He may get the death penalty. He may get the death penalty, but at least he's got the voltage lowered a little bit. So what Kafka is concerned with is the way in which the law has become privatized. And I think this becomes clearest as the novel goes on, that the law we think of as a public force, a public entity. It has a public status. But Kafka is chronicling the way in which, as modernity goes on, the law becomes increasingly beholden to private interests and becomes increasingly a private domain. And what happens when that, when that goes on is that the law ceases to be public and open, that it ceases to be accessible to everyone. And instead, the law doesn't deal with the subject in an above board way. So you're constantly, when you're bombarded by the law, you're never bombarded straightforwardly and openly. It's always in an underhanded, covert, subterranean way. This is how Kafka puts it in the trial. The narrator puts it. The proceedings are kept secret, not only from the public, but from the accused as well. One mounts a defense through contacts. This is what Kay learns from the lawyer, not through logical argumentation. So it doesn't matter whether you're guilty or innocent. That's not a question. The question is, what kind of contacts that can do you have what kind of maneuvering can you do relative to the court and the officials of the court? So it's not about what we think a trial should be about. That is weighing of evidence, etc. That just plays no part in Kafka's vision of the law here. So in, I think in essence, you might say one doesn't hire a lawyer, but a fixer. That the fixer is really the only way you can navigate the trial. And I think there's a nice little great example of the fixer in the Tony Gilroy film Michael Clayton starring George Clooney. There's no angle, there's no champagne room. I'm not a miracle worker, I'm a janitor. The math on this is simple. The smaller the mess, the easier it is for me to clean up. What's the police, isn't it? No. They don't call. One of the great scenes in the history of cinema, I think, and also an indication of the limits of the fixer. And I think, in a way, the trial is also about the limits of the fixer. It turns every lawyer into a fixer, but the fixer can basically just clean up the mess to basically act as a janitor and can't really solve the fundamental problem of the trial. And I think the reason why is because even the court officials don't know the inner workings of the court. So there's this fundamental mystery attached to the court. And I think that mystery is suggestive of this private domain within the larger public nature of the court. So the court is ostensibly a public institution, but within it's all invested and in, 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 in infected with privacy. Which is why the court painter Tortorelli has more knowledge of the court than and even the lawyer. So he seems to know more about the court than anyone else that Kay encounters. And he's actually, what's interesting is his position is, as court painter, is almost the privileged position in the novel. So we hear other people make pronouncements about how the court functions, but it seems like the court painter actually knows more. And Kay goes to Titarelli to seek some kind of inside access to the court. So that is ostensibly, in the world of the trial, how it's done, that you have to get inside access. You can't go directly 
to the court, you have to take an indirect route because it's a private, these private interests overshadow the public nature of the court. So if it was public, you could just go directly toward it. But because it's not, you have to go to Titarelli or some other figure that has this secret path to take. And what Kay finds is that Titarelli is not actually separate from the court. And I think this is a really important aspect of the novel, that where Kay thinks there will be, he'll find a vehicle to get to the court, he actually finds that vehicle is connected to the court so that it's as if the tentacles of the court spread everywhere in the universe of the novel. And you have to try to navigate that and that you, the path you think that's going to get you to the court, I mean, once you take that path, you're already in the court. And that's why it's important that Titarelli is not this figure external or a, a pathway to the court. He is the court. And interestingly, even those little girls outside who block Kay's interest, entrance to the studio and, and constantly harass Titarelli, they're actually part of the court too. So there's the... the Kafka's really creating the sense that there's not an outside to the court, that maybe even Kay himself is in it. And that's what he doesn't recognize, his own internality to the court structure. What Kay desires is someone who's outside, but who knows the inner workings. The problem is, though, there's really no one he encounters that's fully outside. And there's also no one who really knows and this lack of knowledge about the workings of the court is something very crucial. And I think it's, again, indicative of the fact that the court is not public, that if the court were a public entity, you could know its workings. But no one can know its workings because there are all these private interests that are controlling the functioning of the court. He does learn from Titarelli that there are three forms of release. And these, I think this is a, just a fascinating way that Kafka shows how we are controlled by certain aspects of the social order. So the first form of release, actual acquittal, basically doesn't exist. But it's important that there is the idea of it. So there's the idea of becoming completely free, even though no one Titarelli knows no one who's actually attained it. So it's this impossible ideal that exists to help keep people in line and keep people thinking that it does exist as a possibility. The other two are our real possibilities, apparent acquittal and protraction. And those are two both also fascinating because they show how control actually works. So it works in one of two ways. Apparent acquittal, you can apparently get off and you do a lot of work to get to that apparent acquittal and then you're free but you're never totally free you never know when the law is going to come back down on you and protraction is the opposite you're constantly worried about the law you're never totally free from it but you're never acquitted either so you're constantly working you're never put in jail you're never you're never convicted but you're also never free. So there's a way in which they're two opposite. One is a more temporary solution. One's a more permanent, but they both leave you constantly in a state of anxiety about what the law is going to do relative to you. So both are both are flawed solutions. And if you had to choose between them, it seems like an impossible choice, like worse or worst, and no choice that's better. So Titarelli says to, says to Kay, I know of no actual acquittals, but I know many instances of influence. So this is really, I think, a crucial statement because we see how it's influence, not evidence or innocence, that makes the difference. So influence can change things. Evidence can't. And this difference, the difference between, so apparent acquittal leaves one constantly fearing a new arrest Protraction requires constant concern for one's case, and in neither case is one out of, out of danger. So none of the solutions that Titarelli offers is permanent. They all leave one in the, with, within the tentacles 
of the court and unable to get free of that. And as a result, the court leaves the subject, K in this case, in a position of unending doubt and anxiety. So that, that creation of anxiety is really what the court is aiming at, and it's a result of its private dimension. So the fact that it's not a public institution causes it to generate anxiety in the way that it does because of all the private interests that have completely overtaken the court cause it to not be to be fundamentally unclear in its relation to the subject. And Kay even goes so far as to buy three paintings from Titarelli on the idea that maybe that'll make a difference and get him on my side and get him to work the court for me. So there's no way to know what gesture is going to be the key gesture. So you have to try to try anything or everything. And so he buys the paintings just on the off chance, on the chance that it'll help his case. But what's interesting is no matter how the case goes, Kay gets acquitted, we, whatever happens, there will never be a public record of it. As Titarelli tells him, the final verdicts of the court are not published and not even the judges have access to them. Thus, only legends remain about ancient court cases. So the lack, again, the lack of, of publicity about the court create, makes it much more oppressive that if things are open, then there's a way in which they can be challenged. But if everything's private, then it's impossible to challenge it. And that's the way the court really creates its control over people. And we see how in this figure of the merchant block, I thought this is an interesting section that Kafka includes in the novel, that we see block undergo extreme humiliation on, on the, from the part of the lawyer and, and Kay looks at that. He's able to observe it. And that's part of the way in which he's also taught that he has to stay in line because we see Block do up, go to any lengths to stay within the lawyer's favor, going so far as to move into a bedroom in the lawyer's office just so that he won't, he won't miss an appointment. So he's, he's really at the beck and call of his lawyer even though the lawyer, should we imagine, should be working for him, but that's not the way it works. So the defendant is at such, at such a disadvantage and is in such a humiliated state that there's no way he can get any purchase on his own situation. And this is because the point of the law is not justice, but this creation of an apparatus of control that keeps people in line and it keeps them in line through the generation of anxiety. So the anxiety that we see in Block, the anxiety that we see in K, this is exactly the point of the law in this privatized form. And this then I think comes to a head when K comes to the cathedral in the penultimate chapter of the book and he's going to meet this Italian business person on a, on a, to show him around the cathedral. And it turns out the priest there is actually ready to talk to him about his case. So even though he goes there on a completely different errand, he ends up being expected. And I think this is one of the things that characterizes many of the counters in the novel, that someone seems to know where Kay is going to be at all times, even though no one really knows the secret of the law itself. So there's a knowledge about K within the law, but not a knowledge about law itself. And that is, I think, again, this opposition between the way in which the private has overtaken the public in the law. So the priest addresses K, and this is, I think, one of the crucial sequences of the novel and one of the times in which Kafka is really laying bare how he thinks the law is functioning today and how we might be able to respond to it. So one of the things the legal apparatus does is it creates this idea or appearance of a secret knowledge functioning behind the scenes, in the shadows, that we can't see. And Kay is constantly taken by this notion of a secret within the law that he has to figure out or that 
he can get someone to tell him about. He's obsessed with this idea, and that's what generates the anxiety that he feels. And the law addresses K, no matter where he is, as if he were expected there. So there's no point at which he escapes the reaches of the law. And yet, as I said, there's no one who really knows the secret of the law. So the way in which knowledge functions is interesting because it whole it's k everything that he does is known but there really is no knower attached to this knowledge but this important exchange happens with the priest when k hears the fable before the law which is an which is a, a section of the novel that k, that kafka wrote apart from the trial and then inserted in it and the fable prompts K, I think, to recognize his own role in his relationship with the law. That K wrongly sees the law as an external force relative to him. And he doesn't see the way in which there's mutual dependence between his own thinking, his own quest, his own actions, and those of the law. So the law is not neutral but at, rather, you could say that it's specifically organized around K's desire and around the desire of every subject. So K doesn't recognize that. But the fable that is, the priest recounts to him actually points him in that direction. So before the law tells of a man from the country who comes to the law and seeks admittance to the law, but there's a guard protecting the gate that would give him entrance to the law who prohibits him from entering, and the guard lets him know that no matter what he does, he won't go in because the guards beyond him are infinitely stronger than him, so there's really no way he's going to get in. And yet the man stays there and continues to make entreaties to the guard, tries to bribe him. He wants to gain access to the law, and he, makes a, he stays there for his entire lifetime. But then as the man nears death, the guard decides to take pity on him, and he actually tells him the secret of the law. So this is what the man has been waiting for. And we can see this in Orson Welles' film version of the trial, where he retells this fable and, gets and, and describes this point where the man gets near death and the guard relates the secret to him. No one else but you could ever have obtained admittance. No one else could enter this door. This door was intended only for you. And now, I'm going to close it. This great line, no one else could gain admittance here because this entrance was meant solely for you. I'm going to go and shut it now. That's what the guard says to him. And it's fascinating because it suggests a structure of the law that isn't necessarily, I don't think, apparent in the novel up to this point. That the door of the law is not a door in general, but rather specifically made for the man from the country, or you might say specifically made for each individual subject relative to that individual subject's desire. So the law is not the way in which the law relates to us is not a relationship in general, but always a specific or particular one. In other words, the secret of the law is not is that it's not already there, existing prior to our interaction with it. And I think that's really maybe the crucial insight of the before the law fable. That if we we are we tend to think that the law has a separate existence from us. And K never really gets beyond that way of thinking, even when he gets this fable from the priest. He doesn't really get this idea that the law is actually connected to him and to how he acts. He doesn't see. He thinks that there's something external to him and thus something that has a secret separate from him. But there isn't. So you might say that before the law is a fable of freedom because it tells us how we can recognize the law not as this alien oppressive force, but rather 
a response to our own or something that interacts with our own desire. But the priest, I think, plays a little fast and loose with Kay on the, on this issue because while he does point to the possibility for freedom with the fable that he tells, he also encourages Kay to just bow to necessity and forget any quest for truth. He tells him, you don't have to consider everything true. You just have to consider it necessary. And then Kay, I think this is a nice response. He says, a depressing opinion, lies are made into a universal system. And this is basically, Kay here correctly analyzes how the law functions in the trial, that lies are made into a universal system. But this is an insight Kay has. But then on the other, on the other hand, he does miss the way in which the court doesn't have a secret of its own apart from himself and the way he interacts with it. So he gets to some insight after his interaction with the priest and throughout the trial, but he doesn't get to this key insight that I think might free him from the dominance of the court, at least psychically. The priest then says to him, the court wants nothing from you. It receives you when you come and dismisses you when you go. In a way, I think here he's saying along the lines of the idea of freedom that he was offering with the before the law fable that that the court, there's no, again, no hidden desire in the court, that it's a response to all the subjects that address it. Then at the end of the novel, it's interesting that Kay kind of accedes to what's happening to him. That the the people coming to execute him, they come to they come to kill him, and then he basically just gives in, and he he gives in psychically and physically, and he refuses to take the knife and actually do the deed of killing himself. But at no time does he put up resistance to these assassins. So the final result of the novel is the emotion of shame. And the great last line of the novel, it seemed as though the shame was to outlive him. And the question is, I think, why shame? What about what Kay does is shameful? And I think it's about the way in which the whole, and this I think occurs in the whole trial, the way in which this, these private experiences of Kay's are brought out into the public. So the entire court structure and the trial system is a process of bringing the private into the public. And so this is why it almost inherently generates the shame of the private being shown publicly. And this is, I think, shame becomes an overriding emotion in an epoch when the law becomes a private force because the law and the court cease to be just public, but actually are a public domain in which the private is exposed. And I think that's really the one of the key problems that Kafka is trying to address in this novel. That the law becomes a private domain operate, operating in public view. I think you you could almost say that that's one of Kafka's really overriding ideas and overriding critiques in the trial. And this is what generates shame, that we experience shame whenever the private appears in public. I think the greatest filmic example of shame occurs in the 1990s film American Pie, where Jim, a character who's a high school senior, has never had sex and he wants to learn about or he, he's, he wants to practice uh, sexual, a sexual experience. And his friends tell him that uh, the female genitalia is a, like apple pie. And so when he sees an apple pie on his parents' kitchen countertop, he decides to practice a little bit with it. And this would be fine, except masturbation is probably the most private activity. So when that becomes public, it's a it's a site of incredible shame, as this scene really nicely shows. Yeah. Uh, uh. Oh, Jim? It's not what it looks like. In a sense, the trial ends, like this scene in American Pie, with Kay stuck in shame, except unlike Jim, he's unable to escape it. And 
Kafka's chronicling, he thinks, an epoch in which shame becomes the predominant emotion. Except if we can't, if we're still stuck in the situation that produces shame and we fail to feel shame, then we become figures of shamelessness. 